started having labor shortages back in about 10 years ago. And then during um, the Obama years, there was a lot of deportations, there was strengthening of the border. It, it really put a, a damper on, on labor and everybody started feeling it. We have a limited number of people that are uh, able to do the work in the fields and, and willing to do the work in the fields. And we have an aging population of, of farm workers all across California. Something that happened here in the last few years in California that's it's really bad for California farm workers, for California agriculture, is the uh, changes made in the overtime uh, regulations in California. I know a lot of farm workers, and I, don't, I have never met one that for whom a 40-hour work week makes any sense at all, has any desire for a 40-hour work week. And I just question whether the legislature ever bothered to talk to farm workers. There's a lot of myths, you know, um, out there. Uh, one of them being that if you're Mexican, you're working out in the field, you got no papers. That doesn't mean that just by working out in the field and being Mexican that you're illegal. If there was an immigration reform, they would like to have legal status. Legal status so that they don't have to worry about being deported. Legal status so that their children can go to school here. Um, they're not asking you know, the world. They're asking just for legal status. They want to be allowed to work. You know, there's a, there's a great myth in the United States that everybody wants to live here. We have populations of people that want to come here and work here, but they want to live at home in Mexico. You know, like my farm, I can grow all of my crops with 25 people, but I need 300 to harvest them for three months. One of the coolest things about working in agriculture is that agriculture is one of the few industries left where nobody cares about the letters you have after your name. They only care about what you can do in the workplace. Can you get the job done? We have a great respect for the people we have working on our farm. Many of them have worked for us for probably 15, 20 years or more. See, when I see these people, it's like lo looking at my ancestors in the 1930s and 40s doing this work. So yeah, I care about them because I know I know where they come from. I know their their dreams and aspirations are to help their family. You know, these folks are probably not going to go to college and become a professional, but their kids are because of them. They want to provide for their families, and they're willing to work out in the heat. They're willing to do the backbreaking job that other people won't do. They are, in my opinion, people to respect because they're providing for their families and they're putting food in our tables as well. La verdad sí me sí estoy orgullosa de de este poner del trabajo del campo me siento orgullosa de poner este los alimentos en mi casa y también para poner eh, ponérselos a muchas personas porque la fruta de aquí no nomás se queda en Estados Unidos también sale se exporta a otros países y la realidad que sí me siento orgullosa. Production funding for American Grown, My Job Depends on Ag, provided by James G. Parker Insurance Associates, helping to protect and grow Valley Agribusiness in California for over 40 years. By the Gar and Esther Tatillion Charitable Foundation, a legacy of giving to support the people that make agriculture grow. Farms feed families, public television feeds minds. By Brandt, professional agriculture supporting the heroes that work hard to feed a hungry world every day. By Unwired Broadband, today's internet for rural Central California, keeping Valley agriculture connected since 2003. By Harris Farms, a tradition of working forward to protect the future of water, ranches, and farms in California and beyond. And by Valley Air Conditioning and Repair, family owned for a half century dedicated to supporting Valley agriculture and the families that grow our nation's food. There is a balm in Gilead It comes like wisdom Speaks like children It's a sight to the blind And a strength to my weakness Something for soul, body, mind. My parents 
came here as migrant farm workers in the 30s and 40s. Uh, they came here following cantaloupes from Imperial Valley, right to this area, uh, but also Huron and Patterson, and uh, eventually settled here in the 1950s. My dad was hired to become uh, a manager on a farm growing melons. So he already knew the harvest of melons, now he's gonna become a grower. And that's where I grew up, with him, growing melons. And since I was a boy, he took me out as, uh, from 10 years old on, every summer and a lot of weekends, come out and work on the farm, do all the work on the farm, everything from planting, cultivating, irrigating, picking, all of that stuff. Uh, and so ev eventually I went to college and when I came back 10 years later, I decided to start my own farm in 1985. And so I'm right here in the same area where I grew up in. My old home was about seven miles away. And uh, so I've established myself here as a melon farmer. There is a ball in Gilead. We're almost in the center of California here. We're on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley. Um, kind of due west of Fresno and, uh, and right on Interstate 5. So kind of at a crossroads here. And uh, this is a great place for cantaloupes and almonds, tomatoes. Um, the San Joaquin Valley is so diverse and every area has found what does best in their area, right? So like down in you know, the southeast part of the valley, you see citrus. On the east side, you got, you got the stone fruit. In the middle, you got the, you know, the wine grapes and raisins and so we're, we're blessed and, and right here, we grow some of the best cantaloupes that you can find anywhere. Today, you know, we farm about 2,000 acres. Uh, about half of it is organic crops, most of that being melons. We do a few uh, of asparagus and, and corn, sweet corn, but our, our main effort is in, uh, in organic melons. So, I'm not picking this, okay? We got a crew of experts over there that have picked it, but this is a, this is, you know, a mini watermelon. It's organic. Uh, we, we pick and pack them here, and then we ship them all over the country to some of the best chain stores in the U.S. I know well enough to hire good people, and those guys are skilled. I just defer to them. I, I could probably hit and miss and get a good one most of the time, but not always, like they do. Farm labor has always been a part of our operation, uh, more so than a lot of other farms, because our melons are hand-picked and packed. And so early on, I, I realized that um, these folks are gonna be really important. So we developed a culture on our farm of, of having a place that they would work at, and even if they were seasonal, they would come back. That's very important to us. My wife has been instrumental in that because she was a farm worker herself. She has a great relationship with the people and they, they follow her. So that's really a, a great key to, to our, our success. Buenos dias, ¿cómo va? I would say that probably about 40% of our people leave and come from, from another area. Um, that is our seasonal people. Our year-round people, the ones that do the planting and irrigating and stuff, they're here permanently. But of our harvest crew, which is anywhere from 275 to 300 people, there's a pretty good chunk of them that go back either to Mexico or to Arizona, and they come back every year. Uh, I'm Miles Ryder. I'm chairman and CEO of Driscoll Berries. Uh, we're in Watsonville, California, which is uh, the headquarters of our company. We've been quite public in Driscoll's about, uh, you know, uh, our thoughts on immigration, which really include three things. Um, that there is a, you know, sort of path to legality for people here right now. Um, and this isn't just an ag issue. I mean, um, we got a lot of contributors and it's uh, such a messy situation. We do think that the border should have integrity. That border will never really work unless there's an outlet for to match up people that want to work and jobs that are available that don't have a, you know, internal, for which there's not an internal workforce. 
The landscape has changed quite a bit. When I first got involved, we had a lot of migration back and forth between the United States and Mexico, um, where many workers would work here for the harvest and then they would return home to Mexico and then return for the harvest the following year. Now we have a much more stable population of workers um, who stay in the United States year round uh, and have settled here. Uh, we also have uh, a much tighter supply of farm labor now than we ever did before. Um, wages are up in farm labor and that's just a sign of scarcity, it's supply and demand. Things like our cantaloupes, our cherries, table grapes, some of these things, you know, berries, are going to be very difficult to harvest uh, mechanically. Why? Because the, the sel selectivity uh, of the crop and the um, the way they have to be handled very gently. Now, if you develop a variety that doesn't get damaged or bruised, it's gonna be a bionic uh, fruit that is probably not gonna eat the same way as the fruit that you're used to eating now. Uh, you just have to get used to a lot less fruit. I mean, it, it's, a fruit is really labor intensive, it's delicate. Uh, I, we grow strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, and blueberries, those are super delicate. Everything's hand harvested except for a little bit of the blueberries. Um, they just won't have them if they're not people, uh, people to do the work. There are a lot of false perceptions out there uh, and I, uh, about farm labor and about farm jobs. And I think, I think it's a political stigma because some folks have managed to build careers around this idea that farmers are abusing people in the fields. Farmers need that labor more than any other business you'll ever see because farm workers are not easily replaceable and those precious perishable commodities need to get out of the fields. The cows need to be milked. If a dairyman abuses his workers, the dairyman's gonna be out there on Christmas morning milking those cows. We, we've had a very difficult time getting, getting labor from the cities. Um, I think in the 38 years, I've had one person come from a large city that actually wanted to work on farm. You know, we know it's difficult work, it's hard, it's hot out here in the summer. You know, it's usually over 100 degrees and uh, we still have to get the work done. But we just have had absolutely uh, no, no one come from the cities. Ye years ago, you know, it was a, an honorable job, but now we just have a real hard time getting anyone from uh, the metropolitan areas to want to work on a farm. I'm not sure when this attitude developed culturally that farm labor was somehow dirty or oppressive or awful work. In fact, what I've seen over the course of my career is that farm labor provides a tremendous opportunity. We do have a program. We're really trying to make the work more appealing um, to local residents, say especially young people, kind of going through school or out of school, they're looking to make some money. Uh, you know, the, 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 the wages are really pretty attractive. It's just we've allowed, somehow allowed farm work to seem demeaning or something. Um, I don't get it. Uh, everybody I know, I did a lot of farm work growing up and everybody I knew, that not, I don't know any of them that regret it. Maybe there's some, but I haven't met them. This particular field here, it's 150 acres, and we got most of it in watermelon, some in cantaloupe. Um, when I was like 13 years old, I worked in this field. I was uh, helping my dad with the melon harvest, and I was driving a, a tractor similar to that out here pulling trailers in the field harvesting cantaloupes. I was 13 years old and, and uh, working in the harvest, and I own the land now. <laughs> and the operation. If I'd ever known I'd ever known how you'd forever change my life I was born in Mexico. At the age of 15, we ended up migrating to the U.S. Came, went to high school, went to high school over at Porterville. Right after that, went to Porterville College. Had a full-time job at a packing house. And right after college, I went to work as an intern for a P uh, CPA in Porterville. Right after that, I got to know a grower 
His name is Permander Brar. He gave me the opportunity to work for him at the cold storage as his cold storage manager slash accountant. And right after that, I saw the battles he was having with the uh, crews out in the field. And one day I just basically asked him, I said, hey, give me the opportunity to become a farm labor contractor, be loyal to you and have the crews just work for your fields. And he liked the idea because at that time, a lot of contractors would come and go because when the bigger companies would get started, they would pull the crews from his fields and go work for the bigger companies. I saw the opportunity, he saw the opportunity as well. He said the day you get a farm labor contractor license, insurances, and do the training for your crews, and you can prove that to me, I'll give you all of my business. And up to this day, I'm still working for him. That was back in 2012 when we started. Clean the green. Huh? Ready for the table. <laughs> when I first moved to the U.S., we were legal residents. My dad, back in the 80s, became a citizen, and somewhere around the 90s, he actually went through the whole process of immigration to migrate his family legally to the U.S. Um, we were kind of coming and going, and then after I became a farm labor contractor, we decided to all stay here in the U.S. and continue this business. We saw the opportunity that the U.S. is offering us, and honestly, there's no other place that I would want to be at. I take a lot of pride in what I do, especially having the support from my family members, from my dad, my mom, my brothers, my sisters, my cousins and friends, there's a lot of people that work with us. I don't see them as employees, I see them more as family. We currently have about 600 employees that work with us and I see them as a big family. Porque en realidad tenemos mucha necesidad de trabajar y este pues realmente cuando uno no es estudiado, esto es lo único que uno sabe hacer y pues siempre viene uno a trabajar al campo. En realidad de aquí comemos, de aquí renta, de aquí todos los biles, de aquí mantenemos la familia. Pues sabemos muchas personas que queremos que cambie principalmente la discriminación. Eso es lo que más duro que nos ha tocado pasar y no nomás yo, ha habido este, um, diferentes etnias de, 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 ¿cómo se dice? De, de personas que las hemos pasado. Y yo pienso que eso sería muy importante para tratar de cambiar el sistema de vida, a la discriminación. Es muy importante que no, no este, la gente no la siga, este, ¿cómo se dice? Um, siguiendo alimentándola de odio, de racismo, porque yo pienso que eso da para abajo, está muy mal. No, no nos sentimos bien. La verdad que no nos sentimos seguros. Y siempre, día con día, vivemos más y más, y no nomás yo. Viven gentes que en realidad uh, no tienen por qué uh, pasar esos problemas porque uh, es un sentido de la persona que en realidad nos sentimos como, pues yo la verdad nos sentimos muy mal, nos sentimos como si no valemos, la verdad. Pero sí valemos mucho. Mucho valemos porque nosotros, y yo me pongo, digo nosotros, porque somos muchos que trabajamos la mayoría en el fil. Y yo pienso que es injusto. Hay un troje, troje de 10 paletas allá. ¿Allá? Sí, y una ahí de parte de lo que hay aquí. Yeah. I think we're at a point where the government has to start looking at the ag industry more seriously and start backing off a little bit with all the laws and regulation that they're pushing towards the growers and start helping, start conversating, not just trying to push things to the growers and the farm labor contractors because the ag industry as it is, it's a big gamble. And then we start pushing minimum wage to go up every year. Prices for the produce continues being about the same, but the expenses continue skyrocketing. 
en realidad escogí este trabajo porque no estudié, no estudié. Y pues para estudiar ahorita ya se me hace demasiado tarde y pues aquí yo pienso que pues este va a ser mi trabajo todo el tiempo. I have seen more acts of generosity and kindness from employer to employee in agriculture than I've seen in any other industry. And I see the workers themselves taking great pride in it. And I'll give you an example. I defended a dairy in a lawsuit a number of years ago. And in the lawsuit, one of the workers was called as a witness at a deposition. He was a breeder. One of the most important jobs in a dairy, it's a mixture of art and science, is being able to breed those cows successfully. And it's the future of the dairy, because without procreation, there's no milk. So this gentleman was describing how he does the work and what his job was to a college-educated young lawyer. I don't think she had ever been to a dairy or seen a farm in her life. And he could see it on her face as he was describing how they breed the cows. I mean, to put it bluntly, this is a gentleman who spends a lot of his day arm deep in a cow. And uh, she was grossed out by it and kind of disgusted by it. And he actually stopped his testimony and he looked at her and he said, you know, I wish you could come out to the ranch and see us and see how we work with the animals and how beautiful it is to work with these animals and do the work that we do. This was a man who took great, great pride in his work, but a person from an urban environment couldn't relate to that at all. And I think it has a lot to do with the way that we have politicized agriculture and made it this battle between right and left, when I think universally we should embrace agriculture. That's our food source. So we need to have um, a workable uh, guest worker program that allows people to come and work for three months and then go back. And I'm sure there's a lot of people who, in other countries like Mexico that would love to do that. You know, there is a program. Uh, it's arduous, it's expensive, it's arduous. It, it has, can sort of break down when the kind of just the process it gets slowed. It has improved, it's called H2A. Um, so it's a guest worker program. So we actually already have something, it just needs to get, be improved. It's very difficult for a worker to migrate back and forth between the United States and Mexico. Um, one of the practical reasons for that is right now, um, the only legal means to do that is the H-2A program, which is a very bureaucratic and expensive program, and it requires, um, it can only be used by employers who actually have housing they can provide to the workers, and there's a lot of regulatory hoops that the uh, growers or farmers would have to jump through in order to use the H-2A program. In some commodities, for example, like dairy is a year-round commodity, they can't use that program at all because it's for only for seasonal uh, or temporary agricultural employment. The current guest worker program requires that the grower pay the transportation to bring them here, house them, feed them, and transport them to and from work. And there's not many growers here who have housing for 300 workers or six buses to bus them in. I don't have that. The H-2A program requires farmers to do all that. And, and, the, and the minimum wage to those H-2A workers is higher than California's minimum wage. California minimum wage is $12 an hour, and the H-2A minimum wage is something like $14.70. So you have to pay them more than your local workers. So it's not a, a good program. To me, being a farm labor contractor, there's a lot behind it. And what I take pride on is being able to create a lot of jobs for people and be able to feed families. Even though other people don't see it, I know what's happening behind that box. I know what's happening before that, gro before that grocery store gets that product. And I take a lot of pride on it because I know I'm doing something positive for our country. Working out there in the fields is not easy, but we take it very seriously because we're feeding families at the end of the day. Farm workers are among the toughest and most resourceful people that you would ever meet. They are not weak, they are not afraid, and they are certainly not stupid.
Production funding for American Grown, My Job Depends on Ag, provided by James G. Parker Insurance Associates, helping to protect and grow Valley Agribusiness in California for over 40 years. By the Gar and Esther Tatillion Charitable Foundation, a legacy of giving to support the people that make agriculture grow. Farms feed families, public television feeds minds. By Brent, professional agriculture supporting the heroes that work hard to feed a hungry world every day. By Unwired Broadband, today's internet for rural Central California, keeping Valley agriculture connected since 2003. By Harris Farms, a tradition of working forward to protect the future of water, ranches, and farms in California and beyond. And by Valley Air Conditioning and Repair, family owned for a half century dedicated to supporting Valley agriculture and the families that grow our nation's food.